Well, hi, and welcome back to A Boat Called Wanda, and uh, welcome to the rabbit hole. And basically, right after the last update last week, I just quickly nipped in here to have a quick look at something, and I looked down at the bilge, and I just thought, man, it's so frustrating that you can get to the front part of the bilge, and then there's this big sort of um, piece of cabinetry or cabinet front, and then you have to go around the back of that to get to the back side of the bilge, and it'd be really nice if you could just open it up. I knew I shouldn't have done this, but I thought, well, I'll just try and take a little piece of the front of this um, cabinet away and you know just just see how far I can get and um, yeah anyway one thing led to another and six hours later I was ripping everything out until there's nothing left so this is the rabbit hole and now there's absolutely nothing left at all of any of this um, galley space that used to be here there's obviously this front piece that came along here and the bench top which is ripped out um, and the corner piece here and the side, so that's all gone. So the good news is now I've opened up full access to the bilge. But the bad news is I've got to now rebuild basically everything that I've just torn out. Now how about grassy? You've been a little bit naughty and thoughtless. Now basically all of this front cabinet was uh, very interlocked so that you had to take one piece out before you could access the fastenings to the next piece. And basically the last dependent piece is wedged in on the side of this cool box which means that you have to destroy the cool box to get to the fasteners to get that last piece out. I'll show you what I mean. So you can see here the screws and fortunately this piece of timber along here was so waterlogged and rotten that I was able to literally rip it out past these screws. But to get to the other side of these screws I would have had to have um, undone all of these fasteners. But then there's all this um, expandable foam behind here. So that's kind of like adhered onto this which means you would have had to rip it out and then the entire icebox uh, assembly, uh, which is all sort of moulded in, uh, you know, would have been destroyed just to get to this last piece. So with Halberg Rassi, I've said it before and I'll say it again, I mean, the build quality is generally pretty good um, and it's about 95% there in terms of being able to disassemble everything, but you get to that last 5% and there's a gotcha there, which means things don't come out the way they should without having to make a mess of stuff and, you know, end up destroying something. So the good thing is I can rebuild this the way I like it. And when I put everything back, including access to the bilge, I'll make it so that everything can be unfastened or unbolted or unscrewed so that you can get to the components again without ripping stuff up. I mean, don't get me wrong, ripping stuff up is good fun, but uh, yeah, the rabbit hole is pretty deep. So thanks for your comments last week and uh, feedback about the stainless steel tank, whether I should get a stainless steel or try a plastic one. Uh, massive thanks also to SJ, who's uh, appointed himself chief project manager for the fuel tank replacement and has uh, proactively got in touch with Tech Tank. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for that. I, I'm actually going to give uh, Sharon a call in a few days. I just want to get all my measurements um, set up first. So let's get back into it. I'll start out with just showing you some of this uh, timber that I pulled out so you can see what condition it was in. Well, this is the main panel that was at the front of the galley underneath the companionway steps that I cut out. And I guess the good thing about removing it is this was saturated down the bottom here, as you can see with that um, black gunk, which was sitting in, so it just wicked it up. And here I've done a test to see how much I need to sand back to get back to good sort of dry wood, although it's not 100% dry. Uh, and in the end, it needs about a millimeter and a half of sanding to get back through all this black gunk, back to sort of reasonable wood. And the other piece that I'm quite happy to see the back of is this um, sole bearer, which I cut out. I can replace this with a nice dry one. Okay, so next steps for me, uh, something I've not had to do for a long time. I'm going to get some of that plastic and sheet up the interior of the cabin and get my grinder out. And then hopefully just in one day, get her in there and uh, blitz the bilge. I need to grind back all that uh, residue of where the laminate went over the tank. Right, no more excuses.
Well, I've made my mess and cleaned up as much as I can, so let's um, go in there and take a look at uh, what I've just done. It's a little bit of a tight squeeze down here. I can actually, there we go, stand in it. Right, well first up, um, I removed that uh, tabbing all the way along here that basically went over the top of the tank here. The problem with that was I had to chase and chase that seam all the way back because the oil had actually got um, up under that laminate join and all the way to where the two pieces met. So to get that last bit of black line out, I had to you know really be thorough and take it all the way back. So anyway, that's this part done. Now I saw some loose laminate down the bottom there and basically that tabbing that went around that corner had delaminated and there was the black oil behind that so I wanted to take all of that back to you know chase out all of that black oil um, so that needs a little bit of epoxy and uh, some cloth back there and this is that sort of well that uh, held one side of the tank in yeah so there we go all that uh, laminate has been cleaned up okay a couple other things I've done back here I've um, taken back the flow coat around the through holes so that I can um, bed down some proper backing plates and look at getting some fancy new maybe Grocco sea, uh, sea cocks. I'd like to try those actually. My biggest challenge is I've actually spent three hours just on that top section that you can see there um, and to be honest it's still not even ready if I wanted to put some flow coat down the preparation isn't complete. The problem that I've got is there's this bloody obnoxious yellow brown residue glue residue everywhere which is contact cement and that's what was used to hold all that uh, foam insulation in place and it's absolutely everywhere so for surfaces like this it wasn't too bad i got a wire brush attachment for my grinder and it came off pretty easily the problem is as soon as you get into this really coarse fiberglass like up here the glue's in every little sort of indentation and that makes it near impossible to get out and you can see there's a lot of detailed work around here or around these seams um, and so it's just going to take way too long to do so anyway i was talking to rob about it and he said that um, i can borrow his air compressor so i'm actually going to try a little bit of diy grit blasting i've ordered up a bag of medium grit sand and that'll be here early next week and so my uh, my aspiration is is to try and you know grip blast all of this residue off um, so that i can clean this up nicely and get a really good bond for some new flow coat because i want to flow coat all of this and even better would be if that grip blast will actually take this flow coat off because i'd actually like to see what's underneath this in the bilge to make sure that black oil hasn't penetrated or, or sort of come into the laminate and gone down to the bottom there is a little bit of moisture recordings with my moisture meter right down the bottom there um, so yeah i'd really like to get all this flow coat off so that you know if nothing else at least i can put a brand new flow coat on to really seal it up but also just to see what's behind it make sure everything's okay there now the first thing I want to do with this tank exercise is create a template or a replica of this tank um, out of some plywood. I want to do that for two reasons. First of all, if I decide to go with a stainless steel tank, then I need to drop this off at the um, fabrication yard and they'll probably need it for four or five weeks. So in the meantime, I want my own templated model of this so that I can look at how it's going to sit back into the bilge and how I'm going to fix it there and get it in and out of the cabin and stuff. The second reason is if I do decide to go for a plastic tank uh, creating a lighter replica of this means that I can get it in and out easily and use it as a basis to start improving the shape or how I'm going to attach it in so either way it's going to be good to have a lightweight accurate um, replication of this tank so that I've got something to play with so now's the time for some fun woodwork
Okay, so here's the two tanks, and I did such a great job, I bet you can't even tell them apart. Well, I can, it's this one. But uh, yeah, I'd say it's probably good to about a millimetre difference. Um, yeah, I'm really pleased with it. So basically now I can take this and um, take it to the boat and see if it's going to fit down through the, the hatch and how it's going to move into the bilge and then how it's going to sit down into the bilge. And then I can think about how I might uh, rejig this a little bit so that I can actually uh, fasten it into the bilge somehow because the last thing I want to do is laminate the whole thing back into the bilge because that's just too much of a pain in the butt to get to if, if you ever need to in the future. All right, so let's go take a look at that. Okay, so this is my test setup. I've got an outline here of where the worktop bench is going to be and then this is the side of the cabinet. So basically I need to test that I can get the tank down through this way and then uh, through under this beam here or this worktop bench and then obviously I can set up some blocks to lower it down on the bilge. If I can do it that way I won't need to cut anything again if I need to uh, take it out again in the future. So first test Will it come through here? And this is my angle here, so it all looks good. Obviously, I can't really get those handles on the top, but yeah. Oops. Great. Now, will it get under this? I don't think there's going to be any problems with this. It looks already like it's fine, so so long as I have a section here that I can cut out, it'll just slide down that way. I can get um, a block and pulley on the other side of it, and in it will go. Right, just manhandle it down here. There we go. Right, well, securing this in is going to be a lot harder than I thought, and I'm going to have to think about this for a while, I think. Ultimately, the easiest thing to do is exactly what Halberg Rassi did, and that's just laminate down here, up and over, across the top, and down the other side. Originally, I was thinking that I would have um, some hardwood laminated in here to have a nice square side to it so that I could put some lugs on the side of the tank, and then just with a machine threaded uh, bolt, sort of bolt into the side um, of that hardwood and obviously the hardwood sort of epoxied and watertight so you know yeah but that's going to be very difficult to find or to shape pieces that will match this curve here which is not even to a nice square side here um, the other thing is there's a little bit of wobble in it when you push it further back it sort of wedges in a bit better um, but I think also down the sides there I'll need to put some shims to stop it from moving sideways because even if I can secure the top, you know, and bolt that in, I need to make sure the bottom's not swinging. With all that weight, you know, maybe 160 kilograms worth of fuel, you can't afford any movement in this. So, yeah, basically I need to think about this for a while now. It's, it's not going to be as easy as I thought, although I still do really want to try and bolt it in or use some sort of fastenings and not just laminate the whole thing back in. Okay, well I'll catch up with some other little bits and pieces that have been going on. First of all, let's go back to the Coca-Cola test and see what happens with the uh, bronze scuppers that I was working on previously. So obviously I've tipped out the Coke and um, I mean there is some improvement. You can see there's quite a bit of shine there, uh, but the front piece is still quite dull. So I think it would probably need to have some uh, wet and dry or something to go over it and try and get a bit of the shine back. So yeah, that's the Coca-Cola test. It has taken some of the muck off it, but it's not really sort of, you know, stripped it back or anything. Now the second test that I'd like to do, which is uh, thanks to one of the viewers, is to try out some uh, concentrated or distilled vinegar. Um, and that's apparently quite good, so I'm going to go and buy some of that. I've sourced some, so next update I'll show you how that works. But I've got some other bronze fittings that are in pretty bad condition, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll soak them in distilled vinegar and see what happens to them. So originally these bronze scuppers were embedded in the teak, and so the sort of dull colour of the bronze as it um, fades over time, and the brown teak, or the silver teak, 
would have been fine, but now that I'm going to have a shiny white new deck, um, this sort of dull brownish bronze fitting is going to look a bit um, out of place in it, I think. So I want to try and switch to stainless steel to get some really sort of bright, chromey finish type things. So I've just ordered this in, actually. These came from the UK and they were relatively expensive. Hoping that they're really good quality. Uh, I did find some that you could get from Shenzhen in China for about 18 pounds or 15 pounds rather But uh, yeah, you can just never be sure that they really are going to be 316 stainless so Let's see what these are like I think I need Mads here from a sale life to show me how to open a box He always makes it look so cool Right there we go a very highly polished shiny silver stainless steel scupper with a slight indentation here uh, or flange so whereas the original ones were absolutely square on top this has got a little bit of a dip which might help to draw the water in and in fact I might not have to cut the side off the way this one is to get it right into the tow rail because this little uh, indentation or flange Will mean that uh, it'll draw water away from the tow rail and down to here so yeah this could be the one i just had one of these to start with um, to, to try it out and i'll go back and order another three but i think this is going to be fantastic uh, next up i want to make up some uh, backing plates because i'm getting some seacocks delivered probably over the next week and uh, i'm going to try and follow this Seacock sort of best practice guide which I'll put a, a link in uh, down the bottom of the channel if you're interested but they talk about making up these backing plates that they should be fiberglass they should be half an inch I can't believe I'm talking inches 12 millimeters thick and you know I, epoxy polyester vinyl ester doesn't matter I've got a lot of vinyl ester left over so I'm going to use that so the first thing I'm doing is just um, waxing up this piece of formica that I've got handy. Right, well here goes nothing. Well I'm almost there. This is a little bit like making a stir fry out of sort of bits and pieces that you can find in the fridge. I've just got bits of uh, cloth from all different projects. I've got some 1200 quad here. I've got some chopped strand mats. Um, I've got a bit of triaxial. So yeah, it's just like whatever you can find, chuck it all in, cook it up and uh, make a nice, thick, strong backing pad. As you can see here, I've got the fan here because it did uh, generate a little bit of heat. I changed the hardener down to 1% to give it a little bit more of a sort of slower set. Okay, so we're just about done. Bit of pill ply. Right, now I've got a lid. So I'll put this on here. So I'll set this on the ground and then I'll put a 20 kilogram sandbag on top and that's it job done hopefully it'll all come apart well all this fuel tank replacement stuff is fine but i'm starting to feel like there should be a little bit more sanding in my life so i'm going to go back and sand the transom of the boat here so basically the process i've been following is first up to put down a guide coat of black paint and basically the name of the game is the black is evil and you need to get rid of all the black so that you can just see the grey. Uh, and to do that first up I get a 320 orbital sander and give it a light going over. And then I switch over to a long board and I'm using 180 grit here so most of the uh, primer is really coming off in this section. Then I change up to a 320 grit to get it a little bit smoother and finally I'll finish up with some foam backed 400 grit paper by hand. Okay and then you can see here by the help of the guide coat where it leaves the sort of dark patches behind uh, this indicates that it's a little bit of a low spot and then you can see in other places um, like just there I've actually come through and you can see the white underneath or uh, over here you can see the blue underneath yeah, so basically the, the guide coat shows us the high and low and 
And the conclusion I've come to is this whole back part of the transom is, is quite uneven, so I'm going to try and skim it all because this is going to have a very, very bright, high gloss blue stripe along here and it'll just show up any sort of uh, indentations or imperfections in the substrate behind it. I probably should have done this before. I'll skim this and then put another primer on and then rub the primer back and it should be a lot flatter and not have all these highs and lows in it then. Well, it's time to do the dreaded moisture level test again. Um, I came up about a week after I started the heating process and unfortunately nothing had changed. And at that stage, I just had a hot lamp in the locker below. Um, for the past four days, I've had a, um, a space heater in there. I've had the temperature up to about 55, 56 degrees and the humidity down to 18 or 19 percent. So possibly get any hotter dry conditions than that with the tools that I've got so I'm really hoping that this moved this well that's really disappointing and I don't know what else I can do I can't get a warmer drier atmosphere in there but it doesn't seem to be shifting the moisture in that core you know even one notch on this meter and you know, I've got all those holes drilled in underneath, so the core is exposed, that warm air is able to get into it. Um, I just don't know what else I can do at this stage, and it's really uh, annoying me. So, uh, you know, I appreciate people have written in and said, just get a dehumidifier, but clearly it just, it's not doing anything. Um, so apart from getting underneath and ripping off the bottom skin and um, replacing the core from the underneath to the parts against a tow rail, which to be honest, no, I can't, I can't face that. So yeah, if anyone's got any ideas. Okay, I'll leave the update at this point because the video is starting to get a little bit too long. I just wanted to give you an update on where I'm at with a fuel tank replacement. I've spent the last week looking at the options and in particular looking at the tech tank solution, which is one of those high density polyethylene or what people just call plastic uh, tanks. The people at Tech Tank were pretty good. They got back to me with a quote very quickly. The price for the uh, plastic came in about the same price for the stainless steel replacement, so there's not much difference in price between the two. But ultimately, I've decided not to go with a Tech Tank plastic tank, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, when I read the specification, I noticed that it recommends that the tank is not to be stored in an engine room. And if it is to be installed in an engine room, it must be encapsulated in its own box, which I don't want to have to do. Now, I suspect the reason for that is the high density polyethylene has a working temperature of only up to 80 degrees Celsius, which isn't that high really, given that it's going to be containing fuel. For example, if the manifold's leaking boiling water onto the tank, or even if I just want to pour some boiling water into the bilge to give it a clean, that could start to compromise the material, uh, let alone if there was a fire, God forbid, because then you've got the terrible situation where you've got a fire and, you know, 150 litres of diesel contained in a plastic tank that's good to about 80 degrees Celsius. So for those reasons, um, for me personally, a plastic tank is not the right thing for storing diesel fuel and I'll stick with stainless steel. The price is about the same. Um, obviously plastic is lighter and you don't have to worry about galvanic corrosion, but hey ho, swings and roundabouts. So I'm just about to send my tank off locally tomorrow. It will take about six or seven weeks to get a new tank back and obviously I've got lots of work to keep going on with in that time. Um, so. Come back and see me next week. Hopefully by then my sand has been delivered and I've had a chance to start grip blasting the inside of that bilge. And also there's a heap of topside sanding work that I've been doing which I've not had a chance to, to show you. So I'll show you more about that next update. So thanks again for watching and I'll see you then.